Batman experience. Batman experience. Batman experience. Batman experience. Experience. Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience, presented by Underdog Fantasy. If you have not used Code Mayo at Underdog Fantasy to get yourself a first-time deposit match of up to one hundred dollars as of yet, what are you doing? Go do that right now. The link is down in the description. Still a ton of PGA. We have some uh, March basketball going on, I hear. Uh, did not do so great. Uh, the bracket's doing okay, but some of my picks were not great this week. Got to find a new friend to listen to as it pertains to the bracket. But, you know, we're down to Houston for the research, the picks. And it's a tournament that we're used to seeing in the swing season. And it's not like it was devoid of a lot of talent. Like, Scotty Scheffler plays in Houston almost every single year. He is playing here this week. So I suppose, like, betting advice for the week. Week. Scheffler at, I don't know, three to one, two and a half to one, whatever the hell he opens at. It's, you know, it's probably going to be the right bet because he should dominate this course. It is worth noting he has not won at Memorial Park as of yet. Uh, this course tends to play a little bit over par for the field. The winners are obviously going to be in like double digits. When Finau won here, he kind of stormed everyone as a part of the field and just, you know, he led wire to wire as a part of his victory. So, it's a long course. It's a par 70 with five par threes, three par fives, but it's over 7,400 yards. It is daunting, and you have a ton of runoff areas, which we'll see in the fly-through here in a minute. Elevated greens. I think that you want to be targeting some high ball hitters here because it will test you almost tee to green, but if you are short off the tee, you're going to have to make it up with some excellent long iron play or just run a hot putter. The path of least resistance, it's one of those courses where driving distance is just going to pop up every single time as a tiebreaker. Or listen, just because, I mean, maybe Cam Champ can come back and win the Valspar. That would be great. And maybe Champ, Champ Camp ends up becoming a great play for the week. However, just because you hit the ball a zillion yards, that's Derek Ernst, okay? I mean, it worked like once at Quail Hollow 12 years ago. If that's the only skill you present, you may want to get to Vegas and go into one of those long drive competitions rather than play on the PGA Tour, you know what I mean? It's not just going to guarantee you a ton of success uh, at any given course. However, if you could match it with some other things, that all of a sudden could be incredibly helpful. It's a field of 144. You still have time to qualify for the Masters, so there are some names in the field. The field next week at Valero, the week before the Masters, a little bit better, but that's just where we're at right now with these tournaments. I'm excited to get into the Texas swing, although this isn't going to go bent, bent, bent like we usually see into the Masters in terms of grass type. This is going to be played on Bermuda, so keep that in mind, um, and it's at a different type of year than we're normally used to seeing at Memorial Park for Houston, as I mentioned. So moving it from November or the end of October into March, you know, the conditions just might be wildly different, just like when the Masters was held in November that one year. Just you know, shit was off. You know what I mean? So let's get to the course. It's Memorial Park, GC, 7,435 yards. That is a long course. As I mentioned, there are five par threes on the course. There are three par fives. Of the par threes, the number 11th, the 237-yard par three is the toughest hold of birdie on the course, coming in with around a 6% birdie rate. In 2020, when Tony Finau ran train on the field, he birdied the easiest of the par threes in three of the... Uh, three of the four rounds, that would be number two, the 167 yard par three that has a birdie rate of just over 18 percent feet out carded a 62 on the friday uh the last time that we saw this played uh because it was off the schedule last year it got moved because it wasn't a part of the swing season this year even when playing lights out he was still only minus two on the par fours for the week and he kind of like i said just kind of ran over everyone gotta stick your approach close 42.5 percent of birdies Birdie putts come within five feet here. That's well above the tour average of 36.8%. Then you got the par fives. Hole number 16 can really be a hinge hole. 26% of the field goes under par, but 17% score over par. That is a huge discrepancy uh, as a part of five. Yeah, the real hinge hole, number 16, a 13% bogey rate, a 5% double or worse rate, an eagle rate under 1%, 26% birdie rate. So that is a complete hinge here. Uh, there is a real edge to be had in DraftKings Showdown as well. Going front or going back to front means you run into two of the three toughest holes on the course with both carry a 10% birdie rate or lower, an over par rate of 25%. However, when you go front to back, holes 8, 9, and 10 all have a birdie rate over 
12%. Hole 8, 30.1% birdie rate is the high, second highest on the course. The back nine is the tougher set of holes, but golfers get ready for it, uh, ramping up into everything, going from front to back. We'll give you a bit of an edge in showdown at least in my opinion. I mean, just based on the stats, it's just the way it's going to work. It's not even really my opinion. Hole number one is incredibly difficult. Hole number 18 is incredibly difficult. So just do with that what you want, and you'll probably end up being pretty good on that front. We'll jump over to FantasyNational.com right now, and we'll check out what's going on on the scorecard. Like I mentioned, you go front to back. You can see number 18, the third toughest. Number one, the second toughest. So if you do go 8, 9, 10, 8, and 10, pretty easy. I mean, it, Listen, number 10 does play over par, as does number 9. They're not super easy holes, but you get an easy one in the mix, and the birdie rate is way higher, as I pointed out before. And we just sort by yardage in general. You see some pretty daunting par 4s here. You have four of them, three of them, sorry, that are over 500 yards. Another one that is 496, another that is 490. Those are five of the six most difficult holes on the course. You can see a bogey rate. I mean, basically, between those five holes, the field bogeys them one-fourth of the time. So a quarter of the time, you're making bogey. And then even a little bit more, you're making worse. Not a ton of birdies to be had. And you'd think, I mean, listen, I don't do a ton of research. It's actually kind of fun for me on this course because I don't usually do the research shows during the, like, swing season. So I, I always just think it's a little bit of fun to go do it this way when we're trying to figure it out, because now I can kind of really dig into the stats and try to really acclimate myself with the course. I'm familiar with the course. I know the course. I still make my picks, but to do the deep dive, I've never really done that before on the show publicly. It's usually just something quick that we do. So you'd assume because the 200 yard plus bucket on approach, 26% would be, you know, it's, it has the plurality of approaches coming there with the longer par threes, the longer par fours, and the par fives. When you go and take a look at the stats, I think, and this is what my best guess is going to be, is that probably the 175, 150, or 125 bucket is actually more pertinent this week because that's where you're going to score from. Just because you hit a, you know, a good approach from 237 yards or something like that, it's not necessarily a birdie try. You're just hoping to get it close and two putt and then be on your way. Uh, Tom Doak did a complete renovation of this course in 2019, by the the way it started in January the course reopened in November Brooks Kepka assisted with that and the big thing that he did the renovation and redesign brought ravines and water into play but it reduced the number of bunkers from 54 to 19 on the course three of them surround the 18th green there's runoff areas false fronts everywhere and many elevated greens along the way so that's why my initial lean towards high ball hitters uh we'll see if that actually tracks i mean whether it will whether it won't i mean just because you know, is chris goderup gonna win this week the guy has the highest apex percentage of anyone on the pga tour probably not but he is playing a little bit better golf as of right now, you got to find different ways to to get tricky here with Scotty in the field and Wyndham Clark in the field, only because who the, who knows what's going to go on with these guys? Are they just going to kill everyone once again? I mean, probably. It's probably going to be the case. The course history, if we take a look at it, again, these are all from November. So take them with a grain of salt, uh, you know, or if they're right, you know, say, hey, Pat, thanks for showing me the course history here. Tyson Alexander was second last time around. Finau won. Alexander, Ben Taylor, Alex Noren. Alex Smalley, Aaron Rye. So some short hitters here with Norin and Rye, but then you have the Bram wagon. You see Damon. Damon has two top 10 finishes here the past two times that he's played. And although this says 2023, it was a part of the 2023 season. It was played in 2022. So just to give you some background on what Finau did, his 65 on Thursday, he won at minus 16. By the way, that was four ahead of Tyson Alexander. Uh, yeah, he opened with a 65 on Thursday. That was good for a three-way tie of the first round lead. 62 on Friday, put him four ahead, and he just kind of coasted all the way to the end of everything. You see Gary Woodland, Wyndham Clarks, Keith Mitchell, Scotty Scheffler all inside the top 10 that year. Jason Day just outside. I like Jason Day a lot this week, but it's all really going to depend on what happens with the odds like if he comes in at 14 to 1 I'm probably not going to bet Jason Day you see Matt McNeely not having a terrible week at Valspar he ended up making it through the cut he has three top 20s and four starts at this course we know he's long off the tee and he can he can get listen his approach game is just absolutely horrendous and it is again this week but can you get away with that probably not you just kind of need to luck into a really good week and hopefully he does his normal great chipping great putting great driving and then you're off to the races we'll see 
how he did in Houston here. Yeah, he actually had two really good approach years. It's funny because he didn't putt those years like completely lights out. Uh, maybe when you ratchet up the pressure a little bit, you're just not lagging putts in from 50 feet every single time to try to two putt, that your putting might actually get a little bit worse. I mean, that's one of the drawbacks and flaws of strokes gained in a lot of ways that it does penalize some guys who hit the ball really close to the hole because if you miss a six-foot birdie putt then you know, that's not great um but if you're just kind of lagging it up every single time you'll get credit for the lag and credit for the make marginally so but you have fewer instances of really trying to drop a lot of strokes on that front his top six finisher the top six finishers on the leaderboard that year all gained strokes on the field putting from about five to ten and ten to fifteen feet four of them lost ground from fifteen to twenty feet so the year previous to that was 2022 you can see scotty scheffler came t2 that year because jason kokrak won at minus 10 two ahead of scheffler and two ahead of crane or of, was it kramer Hickok? no kevin tway uh, who was not in the field this week but you see tony fina won in puerto rico before there's martin trainer he's a puerto rico open winner himself so just trying to throw out some vibes here of what might be going on a little bit at some of these courses. I mean, Scheffler, I mean, he won the Masters, so maybe the Masters correlation here. It's not what I'm saying. What I am saying, and Puerto Rico, yeah, Damon came in second there one year. Maybe there is something. Maybe these greens rate out the same, or maybe because it's just such a driver-heavy course. Who knows? Vegas was another one who played really well uh, at the Puerto Rico Open over the years. So just seeing some names kind of crop up from time to time. You see Alex Smalley with two top 15 finishes the past two trips to this course. Adam Long, very short hitter, did have back-to-back T11 finishes. Kokrak saved his best for Sunday, shot a 65 on Sunday and separated himself over the weekend. He was seven better than Scheffler and 10 better than Tway over the final two rounds. The finishing position for the best putters for the week, starting in order, 29th, 1st, 2nd, 5th. I think I did Scotty lead the field in putting that week. That would be insane if he did. Uh, no, Kokrak, Kokrak led, sorry, Kelly Kraft led, Kokrak, then Tway, then Trainer. So I assume Scheffler like putted himself out of the tournament. Let's see. Yeah, zero. He gained 11.5 strokes tee to green that year, but that was yet good enough to get it done. Need to make a few more putts. Something which he's doing at this moment. Like it's it's hard to get in front of anyone when Scotty and Wyndham, for that matter, are in the field this time around. Carlos Ortiz won in 2021. He's had a good run uh, in the Texas tournaments over the years. He beat Hideki and Dustin Johnson by two strokes, 68 or better in every round. He was 65 on Sunday that year. Um, Ortiz wasn't really anything special off the tee, but he was top five in the field in chipping and putting where he gained almost 12 strokes against the field that year. You see Mac Hughes, T30s, each of the past three times at this course. Jason Day was T7 that year. You see Matt McNeely again. There was Finau. So Finau went T24 cut first since the redesign. The redesign first year they played it was 2020. The year that Lanto Griffin ended up winning. One one clear of Mark Hubbard and Scott Harrington. Not that strong of a field in that year. But the past few times, like you've had real guys actually play in this tournament. So he won at minus 14. So minus 16, minus 10, minus 13, minus 14 are what the winners have done at this course. Now he comes Comes like the important part and maybe it's such a small sample that it won't really tell us anything that we need to know but maybe we'll try to find some of the stat profiles of guys that did really well at this course see trey mullenix is up there my guy trey mullenix i will tell you too uh right now in terms of apex height i'm not sure exactly how many of these guys in this room i assume got her up is playing uh before we get into that so we'll throw apex Let's see, is Goddard up playing? Gotta Goddard got get up, get down. No, yes, he is in the field. There he is. So he is number one in Apex Height. Dietry is second. He is also in the field. Byunhun Ann is not in the field. He's number three. Oberg is not playing. Keegan is not playing. Wacky Valamaki comes in number six. And we saw that really translate well. I don't know why it's on that. Let's see here. Can we get rid of this? Ugh. Click off of it. Uh, let's see. Wacky Valamaki, Jason Day, Sam Stevens, Cam Young, Rico Hui, Kevin Doherty. Kevin Doherty's actually been pretty good. Hoy's actually making putts at Copperhead, which is terrifying considering I bet him in Puerto Rico. Yeah, Jason Day is playing. Sammy? No, Sammy Valamaki is not playing. However, Sam Stevens is. What a big Kev Doherty. Oh, yeah, big Kev's in the field. 
See how Big Kev is not doing great in the short-term modeling by the strokes gain, but let's see what he's been up to. Miscut, miscut. Mexico, he made the cut. Great ball striking. Dude cannot chip to save his life. And basically cannot putt either. I'm going to open up Puerto Rico to see if there's any names that kind of pop off the page uh, just in case that is something that comes through. Wyndham Clark is slightly after that. Davis Riley, Hayden Buckley, Mackenzie Hughes, who we did see with those decent finishes here. Min Woo Lee, is Min Woo playing? Nah, Min Woo's not playing. Who are the best guys in the field? So Scotty, Clark, Gim, McNeely, Thigala is playing, Hoagie. Hoagie can't chip, and that just unless you hit every green in regulation, that's going to be tough. I would guess that Jake Knapp would have been up there. Keith Mitchell is top 25 in apex height so far this season. Cam Champ is number 25. Higo is number 21. Josh Teeter is 20. So those are a few names. Uh, ADDC. Adrian Dumont, Deschamps, Zalatoris is playing. He's top 30. Finau is still top 30. I think he was top 10 the years that he ended up getting it done at this course. Jagger was another name that we saw up there. He's 34th for the year. Grayson Sig, currently 30th. But you just worry. I mean, he ended up making the cut again. He is in the field, and he's been great. But, like, dude, can't putt. Like, it is outrageous how terrible he is on the greens. Maybe he can finally find something. Carl Yuan uh, inside the top 50. Pearson! Cootie! Sam Burns is another guy with the top 10 here. Chan Kim, Tyson Alexander. So I think that there is something to this apex height at this course in particular. Just when you see, like we did the flyover, you see how many of those greens are just propped up. Like getting them to stick and not falling into those runoff areas are going to be really huge. Uh, and keeping it on the green. So you just don't want to have to rely so much on the around the green game. And, you know, just guys getting frustrated, thinking they hit a really good shot, put a bit too much spin on it, and boom, it's coming back down 30 yards off the green into the rough, and then you're on the collar, and you might fuck up your shot if you end up doing it that way. So uh, I would I would look that up. I mean, I'm going to factor that in when I think about it, make some decisions that way. I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to be like Chris Goderup. You know, probably end up betting Chris Goderup now because of this. But, you know, he's going to be like 300 to 1 or something like that, probably. Actually, not. They, the, the books love Chris Goderup. Uh, I did want to take a look at the, what did I say? Where are we at here? There we are. Nope, that's not it. Leaderboard. Here we are. Puerto Rico Open for this year. Bryce Garnett, short hitter who ends up winning. Eric Bonds. Victor Perez. I think Perez was another one who was actually kind of up there in the A. Actually, no. He is like the exact opposite of Apex site. He's second last on tour behind Camillo Vizegas. Some guys at the bottom like Lonto, who won here. So maybe that's the opposite. I don't know what his stats were for that year. Uh, we see uh, Adri Dumont de Chalre. Good Apex site. Good apex height for, I guess, no one really here. Uh, Matty Schmidt, he gets Matias Schmidt and Matty Schmidt. Uh, both looking good on that front. Uh, getting back in there twice. Eric Barnes is in the like upper half, uh, in case you were wondering about him. So, but he was WD after being like plus eight. Sam Stevens popped up there. We saw him. McClure Messiner. Like, I mean, I don't know if this guy's appeared at the Pierce and Cootie All-Stars, but McClure Messiner sounds like his dad had a lot of money. Maverick McNeely, Pierce and Cootie, Parker Cootie, and McClure Messenger are names that could, you know. Yeah, listen, if you were in a pinch, you need someone to loan you 100 grand. You phone one of these guys. They probably just got, like, in, the, in their couch or something like that. That's at least what it sounds like. You go to their family home and just pull it out of the safe or something. Probably not even in a safe at that point. But those are some of the guys that played well in Puerto Rico. Where did Kevin Doherty finish again? What did I say? He was 36th? No, he missed the cut in Puerto Rico. Not great, pal. Not great on that front whatsoever. Anyway, that's just what I wanted to kind of look at. So stat profile for the course uh, now we get back to that a little bit. So we can see tee to green, obviously very important putting, but a full scope of tee to green. See, you see very little red on this. Like Jaeger was able to do it with chipping and putting alone, which is kind of funny because that's like the opposite of what he normally does. Keith Mitchell does, I mean, he keeps melting down on the weekends. Uh, he's in the hunt at Valspar uh, as in the third round. Like he's just, you know, lingering. There's like 48 guys who are just kind of lingering directly off the lead right now. Uh, you see Wyndham Clark gain across the board and in putting, same as Ben Griffin. Bramlett kind of did the same thing, but dropped some strokes putting. Damon's tee to green was very good here. The leaders, the tee to green, the last time that we did see it, Tyson Alexander, Adam Hadwin. Again, Adam Hadwin's like two off the lead at Copperhead right now. Scheffler, Finau, Bramlett, Norin, Rogers, Davis, Riley. A lot of these guys have actually played really well at Copperhead. Like, 
we see that, you know, Hadwin has his win there. Bram was playing really well this week. Patrick Rogers, not so much at time. Woodland, former winner. Keith Mitchell is playing really well right now. Smalley has played well there in the past. Davis Riley lost in a playoff to Sam Burns at Valspar. So that's somewhat interesting. Here's what I want to get to, though. We'll take a look at the fairways and greens as we kind of go with these guys. So you see a mix between guys that either gain a bunch in driving distance. So for the top five last time, gained a lot on the field, but only Fina was able to parlay that into fairways gain. You see a lot of fairways, and guys aren't losing significantly. Uh, these are wider fairways, so you don't know, take that with it, that guys are going to have to go hog wild here. Woodland gained a bunch. You see a lot here in this middle section of players that gained a lot in terms of driving distance, but weren't dropping, like, outrageous amounts. I mean, The Gallo was the one who dropped an outrageous amount in terms of accuracy. But where were they doing? Was it Were they avoiding the left? Were they avoiding the right? Now yeah, it didn't really seem to make a difference. Green regulations, obviously very high. Uh, it's going to happen in a week where that happens. Good drives. So good drives, you know, kind of popped up, which was a stat that we were looking at Valspar this time around. It's just hard to imagine just the way that Scotty is playing right now because of the distance combined with his accuracy just makes it terrifying. And so maybe the top five market, top 10 market, and what do you do in DraftKings will end up becoming a more prevalent conversation this week. We'll take a look at the proximity gained. Yeah, Finau lost significantly to the field from beyond 200 yards. That wasn't that big of a deal. Where did he gain? Let's see here. You see the top four guys on the leaderboard gained a bunch. Or top three, at least, gained from 75 to 200. Most gained 125 to 150. 150 to 175. You know, three of the top five lost to the field. Aaron Rye lost to the field. He lost to the field like everywhere, except for from beyond 200 yards. So there's a lot of different ways that you can do it, obviously. There's not going to be one bucket that stands out clear above the others, but it thought it was kind of interesting that you know, the guy who ended up winning by so much ended up just losing with his long irons. And maybe that is a complete outlier. Let's look at 2022 to see if it was anything different as it pertains to where the proximity was coming in from. Uh, no, not really. I mean, Kokrak gained a bunch. Tway gained marginally. Scheffler, Hickok, Damon, Trainer, and Streb all lost from beyond 200 yards. The 125 to 150 bucket, most people lost from there. Uh, the 150 to 175, that's where the big gainers were. 175 to 200, big gainers there. A lot of the time, except for Tway, who just, like, was abysmal from that range. And listen, guys aren't going to hit it into the same buckets. Guys who hit it longer are going to have shorter clubs in. Da, da 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 You know the deal by this point. But just to try to get a sense of it, it does seem like 175, 150. Those two, you see a lot more green going down the list than anything else. Uh, and we'll take a look at 2021 to see if that kind of continues to jibe with what we were looking at. Ortiz is going to be horrible here if he gained, what did I say it was? 12 strokes between chipping and putting. Yeah, I would assume his proximity is not great. Yeah, it was from 175 and 150. There we go. It was just really bad from in close. 175, almost unanimous gainers across the board. Ditto with 150. So those are going to be our two areas that we're going to hone in on this week. Once again, I want to let you know to go to underdogfantasy.com right now. Use code MAYO to get yourself a first-time deposit match of up to $100. That link is down in the description right now as well. And the Pat Mayo Experience Listeners League is on underdog right now. It's a Thursday-only tournament for the moment. Thank you all for filling it so quickly for the Valspar. Let's do the same again. It's a completely rake-free tournament. You have to draft, so it's a bit of a different style. I like working in these new games. I'm really working on getting them to do the full tournament rather than just the Thursday, but this is what we got for right now. It's $20 to play, three max entry, uh, $10,000 in the prize pool. There's only 500 spots, so spots tend to go pretty quickly, but the tournament doesn't get released on Underdog until the tea time have been announced on Tuesday afternoon. So check back on Tuesday afternoon. Get yourself the underdog name right now underneath code Mayo, and then boom, you get yourself a first-time deposit match of up to $100. So you deposit $100, you get $200 right away. That gives you what? If you max out the PME open, that's completely rake-free, which I assume is the best tournament on underdog, the only one that is rake-free, especially as it pertains to PGA right now, that you, know, you have at least three weeks. That's if you lose every single time. With only 500 people, you should be able to do a little bit 
better than you did in the 5,000 person tournament that we used to have. We're going to grow this one. It's going to get bigger, but we need your help. So get on Underdog right now. And if you play in some of the states that you know don't have Pick'em, like Pennsylvania or Florida, you can still get in on the drafts. And that's why we did it this way. So everyone in most states and most provinces can get into play in the Pat Mayo Experience Open. All right, Code Mayo underdog fantasy right now hit the link in the description and help out the show thank you let's jump into the modeling and see how we're doing here houston model i did update this i'm not gonna lie to you i didn't want to walk it through a little bit so here's what i got going on off the tee 19 percent, 20 percent, whatever it is i was just using the sliders approach 25 percent around the green 10 putting 10 We'll throw those ones in. In fact, we can actually even get rid of putting. We can add a stat to this. We're going to add in 5 to 10 and 10 to 15 because in the notes that popped up, so many of the players, that's where they had to be clutched from. And when I did my research show last year and talked about which putting stats are actually sticky, those were the two ranges that ended up being the stickiest over the course of the season. That they weren't necessarily completely predictive, but far more predictive than maybe you think. Uh, let's go to the proximity bucket. What did I say? 150 to 175. Let's crank that one up. So 7% for that, 7% for 175 to 200. This entire model will appear in my free newsletter probably monday evening you can join down in the description mayo media Substack if you're looking for it uh like i said completely free to join just get the email sent to you par force 450 to 500 yards 10 percent opportunities gained uh so birdie chances seven percent par fives gained seven percent and those puttings at five and five each will update the model I mean, there's no amount of modeling that can knock Scheffler out of one, but I am curious to see who comes in else at the top. So this is over the past 24 rounds. We have Scotty Scheffler, number one, Hollywood Hoagie, number two, Gim Clark Finau. Those are the top five. This is before the numbers of the Valspar Championship have been entered. So just keep that in mind. Tony Finau, see, woo, Kim. How's your burger? Batia. Okay, now we're talking here. Batia. Another guy who played really well in Puerto Rico. Let's go, Batia. Money on Batia. Money wasted. Love it. Kurt Kitayama, Yaga Bombs. Johnny Vegas, Bud Collie. I did say I was going to bet Bud Collie in Texas. He, you know, kind of choked away the cut line at the Valspar. But the first cut he's missed since his return. Uh, Jake Knapp, Kelly Craft, Will Zalatoris, Keith Mitchell, Joel Damon again. There's Carson Young, Aaron Wright. The Gala comes in 20th. Ryder, Carl Yuan. Alex Noren, Nasty, Nate Lashley, Sig May. Then you got Horschel, Barnes, Hubbard, and Russell Knox. That is the top 30 in the overall rankings right now. And that's only for the past 24. What we can start doing is building out a mixed condition model uh, to kind of take a look at everything. And I don't want to look too much into course history here because it is a different type of year. But what we will do is go to the, where do we want? We want rolling model. And this will give us strokes gain total, but that's okay. What we want to go to is Houston for this. See if that ends up working for us. Hopefully it's not, arg. something went wrong. No, it didn't. So what we want to do now is edit. And we'll play around with it like I usually do. So last four, we're not going to give the greatest weight to, but we'll call last four right around last 100. Uh, last eight, we actually will give some because we want to have some good recent form coming in. So we'll do last eight, last 12, and we'll shrink down last 24, last 50. So we get a good baseline. So eight and 12 are the highest, slightly behind 24. So 23, 20%. And this is just taking the ranges of the model that we just built. So we're going to update that, see who comes out. Uh, because factoring the very short and the very long will give us some different answers to the test here. So Chef we're still number one. Wyndham Clark, obviously, with the way that he's been playing, that makes a ton of sense. See, woo, Kim, Tony Finau, Doug Gim, Will Zalatoris, okay, Aaron Rye, Hoagie, Ryder, Lashley, Vegas, Bud Collie, Jagger, Kelly Craft. We saw, again, what the hell has Kelly Craft been up to? How does he rating out well? Am I missing something with Kelly Craft? No, he played one tournament so far this year. All right, because he played pretty well through the swing season. Actually, that kind of makes sense because he just hasn't been playing. Rico Hui is there. There's Keith Mitchell and Damon. So a lot of the similar guys, but you see Vic Perez jump up, Hayden Springer, and Mark Hubbard, who does have a second place finish at this course. Oh my God, Chris Goderup. And that's not even adding in apex height to anything. Uh, ends up, because he's been playing a little bit better recently, T31. Parker Cootie. Billy Horschel, there's Kevin Doherty. Stat-wise, he actually rates out very well uh, for where his range is going to be at 36th. 
Let's see, Smotherman, Gracerman. Has Gracerman been doing well? I feel like one of these guys who I'm like, couldn't pick out of a lineup of one have been playing a little bit better. He was 15th in Puerto Rico, 47th at Honda. Okay. I mean, that's not terrible by any means. So let's just kind of go with that way. Is that Phillips guy, Captain Phillips? I'm the captain now. The guy who was leading. Yeah, Chandler Phillips. There he is. He is the captain now. Maybe he'll win Valspar. Then say he's too good for this tournament. But what we're going to do is add this to the mix condition model. And with the mixed condition model, obviously, we're going to put the Houston rolling report in. Boop! And now we'll add it to our rankings. Uh, we probably want to get rid of that strokes gain total. We'll update that. Update, update that. We'll update that for the moment. And we'll go back to just general scoring. And we'll go into strokes gained. And now we can fool around with this just a little bit. Uh, we're going to increase... And actually, let's keep it at 24 rounds. Just kind of look down the left-hand side here. So 75% of the time, this course plays difficult. So let's just throw in difficulty and try to find out who are the best players on average, stroke gain total, over the past 24 rounds on difficult courses. Now, not everyone has a ton of rounds. Rico Hui only has three, but he's number two in this. And it makes sense. Guys that are good in majors and the best players tend to play well in these situations. Scheffler, number one, you know, and really gaining a ton over everyone else Wyndham Clark then Will Zalatoris Scheffler and Clark are so much farther ahead on a per round basis on difficult courses than Will Zalatoris it's kind of insane 3.36 strokes gain total per round for Scotty 2.61 for Wyndham Clark in fourth place because we're in third place let's call it Will Zalatoris 1.73 that's almost half of what Scheffler is. Who's in first? Zalatoris is in third. Day is up there. Siwoo is up there. Trace Crow in five rounds is actually all right. I wonder what those five rounds are. Let's try to take a look. Farmers, Wells Fargo, and Honda. I mean, that's not really telling me anything. How's Trace Crow been doing? Crow, not great. Can't chip. Tough scene. Gracerman's up there, though, in his three rounds. Bramlett actually plays these. Maybe Bramlett's the play. He said he's having a pretty good Valspar. He has the distance. This we know. Uh, bad at the players, but has been gaining off the tee. Decent in Mexico. Game with his irons in Mexico. So driver heavy course, Mexico, good. Driver heavy course and at the Farmers, pretty good. Came in 25th. So Bram Wagon, we're going to throw an early star on there. Uh, Chandler Phillips in two rounds. Plays difficult course as well. Big Norm, C.T. Pan, Vince Norman, the Gala is up there too. So let's just throw that one. Bud Colley and Eric Barnes actually popped up on that list too. So we're going to put strokes gain total. And we're going to throw that into the mixed condition model. And we'll start playing around with this. It doesn't really make a difference yet. We'll do all the weightings towards the end. But that's the first one. Like I said, 75% of rounds weighted at this course um, over time have been there. Let's go to T to Green for a second just to see Gracerman. Good Lord. Uh, so of the non-small sample people on difficult courses over their past 24 rounds, you see Scheffler, Zalatoris, Woodland, Siwoo, Berger, Clark, Finau, Smalley plays these conditions really well, as is Chris Goddard up in 15 rounds. I guess hard. I would not have pegged him as a, I uh, don't want to peg him anyway, but I would not have pegged him as someone who just plays difficult courses better, at least tee to green. We know he can't putt, but, you know, we'll see what happens there. Cam Davis, I guess the players wasn't playing as difficult as possible, so Cam Davis couldn't show up in that field. Ryan Fox on difficult courses does play pretty well. You see Parker Cootie up there again. I mean, am I going to fall into the Ryan Fox trap once again? I mean, probably is the answer to that question. But it's interesting to see now that we're playing around with a few of these names of who we see. Um, and so we have difficult courses. Let's go to 7,400 and above because that is what this is going to play at and try to find out who is the best on average on those. Uh, probably Scotty. And the answer is Scotty. But then in seven rounds, we have Hayden Springer, then Sam Stevens, then Clark, then Eric Barnes. So Barnes and Stevens have popped up in a lot of these things. The gala is up there. Oh, Akshay. Done. Sold. Winner. God, man, I can't wait to see Akshay in the Masters. That's going to be awesome. Maybe you already qualified for it anyway. Now I can't remember. Uh, good finishes here really go a long way this week, too, mainly because you can get yourself into the top 50 in the world rankings. I think the cutoff is this week. Now, I think it's after next week, but just getting those points is so alluring right now. But Akshay's there. Joe Highsmith, Lashley. I mean, Lashley had that good Puerto Rico open run. How has he played here over time? I don't remember him popping up with some of those. Let's see, Houston, 38th, and... 
miscut. Never really played all that well, but did have the T3 at Farmers. So it's either a miscut or a top 20 finish. So here are his past 10 starts. 13th, miscut, 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 third. Miscut, 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 10th. I don't know if he's missed enough cuts in a row to generate a top 20 finish at this point. So maybe uh, I'll pump the brakes a little bit there on old nasty Nate, but has been doing well on the longer courses. So T to green wise, because uh, when we did the total, you see Hayden Springer in seven rounds is second in strokes gain total. That is by gaining almost three strokes putting per round, losing strokes T to green. So let's throw T to green into this one. I mean, it's going to give Blaine Hale a lot of love here. Tom Whitney. Tom Whitney's actually, he's in the mix in Valspar as well. He's actually pretty good. I think he was a Ruby's boy. I think he was an Air Force guy out of Colorado. They had a cool story on him at the Torrey Pines. He played really well at Torrey Pines, from what I recall. I think I had a live bet in on him. Yeah, he played. He was 13th at Torrey Pines, playing well this week. So let's throw him onto the list, too. Palmer, Sam Stevens is still up there, Tita Green-wise, as is Zal, as is Finau, as is Scheffler, as you would expect. Siwoo, for a bit of a shorter hitter, I am somewhat surprised that he does pop up. I remember when I had him to win Valero a while back, but uh, he couldn't put his way out of a paper bag, so it was a bit tough on that front. So we'll keep messing around with this, keep updating. So that's long course, Tita Green. So we have difficult course, total, long course, Tita Green. What else do we have here? Bermuda. Wish we could pick the type of year. Oh, you know what? It gives us a chance for the first time ever to use out one of the new filters that we have. Let's see here. Let's scroll down to the state do, 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 and go to Texas. 100% of the time, the Texas Open is played in Texas. Who would have thought? Uh, maybe we'll go... Do we want to go longer term or shorter term? Yeah, let's go 12 rounds for this one. And we'll do strokes gain total. Uh, strokes gain total. We'll look at the average of who plays the best in Texas. Scotty and Scheffler, Day, Stevens, Norin are your top five. Uh, and in the model rank themselves, although all these guys are inside the tie, I guess because the model rank is now being factored in as Texas, and that actually makes a ton of sense. Don't mind me. Tyson Alexander, because he had the good finish here, but other decent finishes in only eight rounds, or is it just all from Houston? Let's see. Charles Schwab miscut, Byron Nelson miscut. All right. No need to keep looking into that one. So maybe we do want to factor it out a little bit more. Let's say 36 rounds for Texas only to give ourselves a larger sample so one tournament doesn't influence too much like it just did with Tyson Alexander, who did play well at this course, obviously, so that's good news. But Scheffler, Finau, Tyson Alexander, still, is still getting, yeah, I guess the paravers, that would make sense. Jason Day, Gary Woodland, Berger, Stevens, Colley, you know, Texas guy. And these are for Texas courses only. See how Colley has done. I mean, these are going to come from like 2020 and beyond. You know, guy tends to make the cut in Texas. TD Green game on point in Texas. Just trying to find good Texas guys. Norin, Horschel. Uh, maybe 36 goes back too much. Maybe we just stick to 24 for these ones. There's no right or wrong answer, even if we should be looking at this stuff. But I think the, that goes back to some of the Horschel's stuff here uh so scheffler finau woodland day burger stevens norin siwu kh lee on a pretty good run um vince norman patrick rogers davis riley again there's bobby mack and only four rounds uh, and i don't think that includes yeah the match play stuff isn't included here but he had a good run in austin at the match play on similar type of putting surfaces by the way the bermuda over there at that pete die course not the same course whatsoever the one's super short and is a real shot makers course but that's where we're at in this one uh despite it being a super long but same similar sort of green so we'll add this one in so now we're, we're getting to where we want to go right now we'll go strokes gain total texas and throw that one in and we'll just wait it like wherever update it keep moving on our way what else do we want to take a look at here? We'll click off of Texas and clear our filters. So we did difficult. We didn't do Bermuda yet. Uh, softness, medium softness for the green. So that you're not going to get your firmest conditions. You know, it's a split about hitting fairways. The rough is pretty average to short. So missing everything average to fast is going to be your green speed. So let's try that. Let's try average to fast. So no lightning in there. And we'll put on a firmness, once that loads, of medium. And we'll click on Bermuda. And maybe that can tell us something about putting. Maybe that's just thinking way too much into it. But that's what the show is all about, right? Is trying to think a bit too much into it. So Bermuda greens, green firmness, medium, green speed, average, and fast. We'll look at the average. And we'll find the putters. 
And who is the best? Trace Crow. This guy just loves being at the top. Oh, Sam Bennett's back in the field. Good for him. Harry Hall. That's over 14 rounds. Wilson Fur, Not to be confused with Aaron Burr from that old Got Milk commercial. But Aaron Wilson Fur, Ben Taylor, who was second place or third place at this tournament the last time that it was played. David, not shirts, but skins popping up there as well. And, and this is just strokes game, putty. Pearson Cody. Jacob Bridgman, Patrick Fishburn. These are like creative players now. Taylor Montgomery, Billy Horschel. So we'll wait this one super low, but we'll add it in just for kicks to try to divvy it up just a little bit. And we'll go with strokes game putting. Add that one in. And now we can find what some of our results are going to be from the mixed condition model. We can compare them to the overall model that we built a little bit earlier. Now it does have elements of that with the Houston rolling model in it. And actually, you know what? There is one more thing that I do want to include into this because I think it's important to add into any mixed condition model that you ever make is just straight up strokes gained total. Just guys that are playing well over their past 12 rounds, recent form beats everything coming in. So we're going to take the average. I mean, that's just the way to look at it. Strokes gain total. Oh, big shocker. Scotty Scheffler uh, killing everyone in the past 12 rounds coming in. We're going to add that in. Strokes gain total over the past 12 rounds and add that in as well. So now we can find our results of the mixed condition model. We're going to weight that pretty heavily. Uh, strokes gain total in Texas. T to green last 24 of the past. And uh, yeah, uh, you know what? The one other thing that I'm going to throw in that I'm not going to weight it super strongly where's driving fairways and greens and we're going to wait this to way back we'll go past 50 rounds just to get a larger sample of everything um and we are not going to include courses that are less than 7200 yards now i know that some of these are but that's why i do the longer filter here i just want to get basically driver mainly courses some of the numbers in here are going to be a bad mix, but that's just the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. And we're going to go driving distance, uh, the best in the field, in case you're wondering. Champ, Goderup, huh? Champ, Goderup, Norman. Why does it keep clicking on me? Stop that. Bramlett, Vegas, Christoph, Ventura, Ventura, Keith Mitchell, Woodland, Matty Schmidt, Wyndham Clark, Ryan Fox, Higo, Big Norm, MJ Duffy. No. Oh. Kevin Yu, back to take more of my money. Toasty! Then you have Sam Stevens, Pearson Cody. Pearson Cody is up there, although Parker, Parker's looking like the better player. And then you have Zalatoris, Doherty is up there as well. So we're just going to add this one in. Uh, we're not going to give it a ton of waiting. We're going to throw in driving distance. Bloop. Add it in. And just to give the mixed condition model a bit more diversity. Uh, we'll throw it you know, lower than the past 12 overall. We'll wait it the same as that uh, weird putting one that we put in with the Bermuda stuff. Uh, past 24 difficult rounds, we'll jack up the price of that a little bit. Uh, the rolling model will, you know, have a little bit above T to green. Once again, I'll include this into the newsletter. And now we'll update the mixed condition model. And now what we'll do is go back to our Houston model. And we'll look at it over the past 24 rounds. Now, once you turn on the filters for 24 rounds, 12 rounds, whatever it might be, that does not affect the mixed condition model because we set what we wanted for that. So the mixed condition model rank is on the left-hand side. The, uh, the rank for the Houston model that I built is on the right-hand side. No shocker, Scheffler is first in both. Wyndham Clark, Zalatoris, Finau, Mav McNeely. Okay, but he rates very poorly in the overall model rank, very good I mean, 41st isn't a horrible. It's in the upper end of the field. It's not elite. So he is the first one that we've seen that is not elite. Everyone else is at least top 20 in both of them. And that goes for the Gala, Gim, and Kali. They're all top 20 in both. Jason Day in the overall model rank is bad. 128th, but he is ninth in the mixed condition model. Did win in Texas a year ago. Jaeger is top 10 in both. Alex Norton is exactly 11th in both. Siwu, 12th and 25th. Then you got Keith Mitchell, great MCM. Bad model rank over the past 24 rounds. Who else do we have here? Rafael Campos. Uh, play, usually plays well at the Puerto Rico Open. Uh, is 104th in the model. And Goderup is 69th, but 19th in the mixed condition model. Bramlett is way higher. Eric Barnes is way higher. David Skins. Victor Perez. Andrew Novak. Hayden Springer. And Ryan Fox all rate out much better in the mixed condition model than they do in the overall model. You see Taylor Moore. Big Norm. Hoagie is someone who gets hurt the other way, probably because he can't chip. That unless he hits 100% of greens and regulation, he's absolutely 
fucked. Then you have Gracerman, C.T. Pan, does better in the mixed condition than he does in the overall model ranking. Parker Cootie, better in those as well. You have the, your anti-guys where you know Tom Hoagie goes from 6th to 35th. Hubbard goes from 9th to 45th. There's Trace Crow again. You should probably learn this guy like what he looks like uh, to try to make it up to him. Davis Thompson, 17th to 50th. Uh, the opposite way, Sam Ryder is 8th. In the model rank, 63rd in the mixed condition model ranking. And again, when you're a member at fantasynational.com, you can make all these things yourself. Plus, you can get yourself, as you can see here right on the screen, to our new leaderboard. It's exclusive to members only. So fantasynational.com slash mayo to get yourself that 20% discount. If you're watching this in Artimenter, this is just for iOS, so Apple phones only at the moment. But look it's worth having. I've been using it all weekend. Everyone just said how great they love this new leaderboard. It's really the way that you're going to be using a leaderboard and it's the app you will use once it's completely open to the public, but it's not going to be for a while. So if you want to use it now, now is that time. I suppose it's time that we guess the odds for the Houston Open. The most difficult odds guess that I think I have to do all season long because it's Scotty, it's Wyndham Clark, it's Will Zalatoris, and kind of everyone else. And if Scotty just went off at five and a half, six to one at the Players Championship, a full field of the best that the PGA Tour has to offer in a tournament that he was the defending champion at, what is he going to do at a Texas tournament where there's like eight good players in the field? I think Scotty's going to open at three to one to win the Houston Open. After that, you're looking at Wyndham Clark. I have it 12 to one. Will Zalatoris, 16 to one. Those are going to be your big three. Then you have a level down in terms of the odds. By my guesses, these aren't the actual odds, all right? Then you have Thigala at 20, Finau at 25, Hoagie at 28. Hoagie Beach. Then you go into your 30s, Jake Knapp, 33, Woo at 35 to 1. And then it's Luke List and Kitayama at 40 to 1, Cam Davis and Bo Hostler at 45 to 1, Taylor Moore and Alex Noren at 50 to 1, Aaron Rye, Ryan Fox, 60, Thor Bjorn Olison, 75 to 1. Maybe there are some other names that sneak in there, but I don't think that there's anyone that I didn't mention that'll be sub. 40 to 1. Maybe they opened Steven Yeager at 40 to 1, but he could just as well open at 80. Ditto for Mark Hubbard and all of the players of that ilk are going to have such a wide range depending on which book you look at at open. So I think that those are trying to figure out the top three is the most difficult part. And then how Scotty being such an overwhelming favorite in this tournament, if he does open at three to one, does that mean Finau is going to be 25 as, I mean, he is the quote unquote defending champion at this course. It was two years ago, but does that mean he goes to 20? Does that mean he goes to 35 because Scotty is just sucking up all that win equity, knowing the sports books, they're just going to rook us on the odds and just take more hold. So the worse the odds, the better for them, really. So I'll say the 25 to 1, the 28 to 1 for some of those guys in that range. I will note, if Day opens 30 or better, I will bet Jason Day. That'll be my first click of the week. And maybe I have to bet Trace Crow, apparently, after doing the research. Who knows? Anyway, code Mayo at Underdog Fantasy. That will really help. FantasyNational.com slash Mayo will get you 20% off that membership and access, if you have iOS too, the brand new test mode for the best leaderboard app that, I mean, that money can buy at this moment, and then it will eventually be free to the masses on Android and iPhones, but that's not going to be for a while right now, but we need your help testing that out, and you get to use it if you are a member, plus all of the tools at FantasyNational.com. Smash like while you're here. Sub to Mayo Media Network, and I will see you next time. Experience! Experience!